Hey there. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? All right, everyone. This is Eileen Kapsaftis. She is a physical therapist and a nutrition educator. She is a best selling author, speaker, international consultant, and applied functional science instructor. She's been helping people eliminate pain and age well for over 30 years. Eileen is also a monthly guest on Chef AJ Live, which is definitely one of my favorites. Today, Eileen will be sharing evidence-based information on the relationship between diet and pain. She will also explain how we can train our bodies functionally using authentic human movement versus conventional exercise methods. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you, Carly. I'm so excited to be here, and um, I'm, I'm really really honored that you invited me um, and that you you thought that what I had to say might benefit your audience. And uh, and so I'm excited to, to be here. Yeah. Thank yes. You. Eileen was actually one of my instructors. So now you all have the privilege of getting to hear some of her um, wisdom and pick her brain a little bit. I have several questions from the audience that we will get into at the end of Eileen's presentation. Okay, so I'm going to start off with some slides because, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. And I wanted to sort of back up the first statement I made, which had to do with the fact that there are no neutral foods. They either promote pain or health in the body. Um, and uh, I've had people kind of joke and try to trick me and say, well, water's neutral. And I say, no, it isn't. Water is a positive. Most people are dehydrated and not consuming enough of it. <laughs> so, all right. So that said, I'm going to share my screen here. And go into the slides. So uh, I'm going to try not to, to fire hose people and have their eyes glaze over, but I do want to cover some important points about how food and pain relate to each other. That's critical, right? So the first thing I want to start off with is I'm not diagnosing anyone. I'm not telling anyone what to do. This is strictly educational. I highly recommend that you have an informed conversation with your prescribing practitioner should you be actively uh, addressing any degenerative conditions in your body. It's very, very important that you make informed decisions. Uh, so this is not me telling anyone what to do. Just want to be clear about that. So, and I want to cover some statistics on a few issues that tend to be common, back pain, for instance, right? Um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but 20% of those who end up having acute low back pain, it becomes chronic uh, at about a year mark if, if the symptoms are persistent. And then in some cases, treatment can successfully relieve that chronic pain. But in other cases, it, despite, it persists no matter what they do medically, no matter what they do surgically, it, it sticks around. And, and there's actually an ICD-10 code for failed back surgery. Uh, there's actually four different codes for that. So it happens a lot more often than we think. And these poor people are having a second surgery and a third surgery. So we really need to do something about this, right? And then there's shoulder pain statistics. Half of all new episodes of shoulder pain will show symptoms or recurrences at six month mark. Uh, as many as four out of 10 still having symptoms a year later. So, and a lot of this, and I won't, don't want to get off on a tangent, but I have to say this, I won't be able to sleep tonight. Everybody wants to beat up the rotator cuff. It's four little muscles that are meant to stabilize the, the head of the, the arm bone in the cup because it's very shallow. Your shoulder is the most mobile joint in your body. And so the rotator cuff is there to provide some, a little more stability while you still have that mobility. But you've got 18 muscles that directly impact your shoulder, of which only four are the rotator cuff. Most people are ignoring the other 14. And then the whole rest of the body impacts indirectly the function of the shoulder. I've actually done a, a four-week class in my academy called Peltruncula, which includes the pelvis, the trunk, and the scapula. <laughs> they all feed each other, right? So yeah, Peltruncula, it sounds like a Halloween term, right? So, so please be aware of that, okay? I'm not going to go into detail and in specific joints today, but I just wanted you to know that if you had issues resolving chronic shoulder issues, it's because you've been focusing on the shoulder and not addressing the rest of the body. And then same thing with hips, right? Hip osteoarthritis, it's a major source of morbidity um, causing pain, gait abnormalities, functional impairments. I mean, it's horrible when your hips aren't right. And then depending on how old you are, if you're in the over 60s, you know, that population has increased. It's doubled in the past three decades in our country. And so now we've got, wow, all these people with all this OA going on, and the cost of it, it's, it's, it's comorbidities, it's just, it's constantly increasing. 
And look at how expensive. $185.5 billion in one year just in this country because of osteoarthritis. And I'm going to show you what food has to do with that in a couple of minutes. And then we've got knee, knee pain statistics, right? The overall prevalence is almost 20% of the population has knee pain. And the older you get, the, the more risk you have of having knee pain. And then the severity of that pain also increases as you uh, add years to your life. Um, and a greater percentage have pain associated with disability. A lot of people are on disability because of knee issues, right? So this is a statement that I have sort of made my mantra. Understanding authentic human function, and I really should emphasize that word authentic, leads to better training choices with improved results. So I, I, I want to sort of mention this about back pain because it's so important. And I, I've actually got an event starting at the end of the month on, on backs. But you may be shocked to find out that 70% of the population that have a diagnosis of lower back pain, nobody knows why they have it. Other exact cause unknown. And we think the medical world has made all of this phenomenal progress. Well, guess what? When it comes to pain, they're really not all that great. And, and yeah, this 27% of this pie chart here, you can see it kind of has a rhyme or a reason, although I'll tell you, I've worked with a ton of people with scoliosis, with disc issues, with degenerative disc disease, all kinds of stuff. So there's a diagnosis there based on imaging. However, it had nothing to do with their pain and we were able to resolve their pain and I didn't wave a magic wand over these things, right? So we've even got to take that into consideration. And then you've got a tiny slice of the pie here where it's something very, very serious, potentially life-threatening depending on what it is. But seven out of 10, they can't even give it a label. It's just low back pain. So we really need to be aware of this stuff, right? So let's look, what causes pain? Well, what you eat, what you put in your mouth can profoundly impact whether or not you experience pain. So we're gonna go over some of this. Food either promotes or combats or fights chronic pain. There are no neutral foods. So how does diet actually relate to pain? I'm giving you the, th the cliff notes right here. You can, if you've got other things to do today, you can go ahead and stop watching right now. High intake of animal foods. Animal foods contain high amounts of arachidonic acid, which I'll go into in a little bit of detail, which contribute to inflammation. And then you've got fats and oils. Fat consumption impairs circulation to your entire body, not just your heart, not just your brain, but in, um, there's a lot of a huge body of research on what it does to the spine, um, as well as, of course, your whole body needs blood supply, right? Every single cell. And then excess weight, excess weight. I know a lot of you are, are you know, on Carly's channel because you are wanting to achieve an ideal weight and, and you want to get your life back. That excess weight can produce inflammatory cytokines, which promotes chronic pain in the body. So of course, when you adopt a nice whole food plant-based diet, low fat, high fiber, it addresses all three of these things, right? So let's look at a little bit of detail here. Saturated fats, all oils, I don't care what it is, canola oil, uh, coconut oil, olive oil, all oils, and dietary cholesterol, which only comes in animal foods. Plants don't have a liver, so they don't make cholesterol. So it's only in animal foods. And animal foods are anything with a face or a mother, even if it swims. So eggs have cholesterol, fish has cholesterol, chicken has cholesterol, right? Um, all of these things damage your endothelial cells. And I, you know, I'm limited in for time here. I, I didn't wanna show you a whole bunch of pictures of endothelial cells and things, but basically they line all of your blood vessels and they do a lot of really important things, one of which is they produce nitric oxide, which is what keeps your blood vessels from constricting. It keeps them from getting too small, which increases blood pressure and damages everything, right? Uh, so it's really important your endothelial cells are healthy. Well, these things injure your endothelial cells. It's actually called endothelial dysfunction. And when you harm them, it will impact nitric oxide production. And that's how Viagra works, by the way. It increases the production of nitric oxide, um, negatively impacts all your blood vessels, not just the vessels to your heart and your brain. And impaired lumbar artery circulation is seen to relate to lots of things, degenerative disc disease, um, back pain, all kinds of things. So it all has to do with circulation 
and whether or not those endothelial cells are healthy, right? So fat consumption does impair circulation in the body. And this is just a little visual here. These are red blood cells. And you can see, you know, they, they, they need to go single file through the capillary, which is your tiniest blood vessel, in order to provide what your body needs on a cellular level. But six to nine hours after a high fat meal, this is what happens. Those red blood cells kind of get sticky. They clump together. So that's going to impair circulation. The, you know, they can't get through the capillary if they're all clumped together. And it stays this way for nine to 12 hours. This is why a lot of people will have a sudden heart attack after a Thanksgiving meal. And we're talking traditional Thanksgiving, not what Dr. General McDougall will tell you to eat, right? And this is a little visual because pictures are worth a thousand words of fat in your blood supply. This was taken from a patient who had had a, uh, a high fat fast food meal, right? Burger and fries, bacon, cheese, burger and fries, whatever it was. And doesn't this look like what happens to gravy when it sits in the fridge? It's like, oh my gosh, why would you want that in your blood supply? So I'm going to show you just a few studies. I, I limited this to just a few so we could get cover a lot of ground here. But this study was published back in 95. And what it found was damage to the arteries uh, in the subjects by the age of 10 years old. And 10% of them had advanced blockages by the age of 20. So we think this is just for the elderly. It's not. This is from young right through. Um, and this problem that was seen in this study was happening at the opening of the lumbar arteries, which su supply blood supply to the lower spine and the muscles surrounding. So how this relates to pain, what they saw in this particular study was the greater the blockage that was seen in the lumbar arteries, the greater the disc degeneration was also seen. Now, depending on how old you are, maybe you're only in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, you don't want to shrink, you don't want to lose height. You've probably got a relative who has told you, you know, they used to be five foot two, but now they're four foot 11, right? No, this doesn't have to happen. This is impaired circulation. That is what's leading to the disc degeneration. It's not, it's not gravity. It's not wear and tear, and it's not old age. It's impaired circulation. Here's another study of oh, 51 patients who had chronic low back pain. These are the people that would be on that 70% of the pie chart, right? No spinal stenosis, no disc herniation. In other words, unknown cause. They found the prevalence of impaired circulation in those lumbar arteries and the middle sacral arteries was two and a half times higher than in corresponding populations. So again, impaired circulation. So simply put, people who have a history of chronic low back pain are much more likely to show upon imaging poor circulation in the blood supply to the spine. And the data, and this is all put out by Dr. Lena Capilla, I'm gonna present her work in just a moment, um, also indicated that patients with above normal LDL, which is the low density lipoprotein, the bad guy, right, and cholesterol, complained of more severe back symptoms and had occluded arteries more often than those who had normal LDL levels of cholesterol. So Dr. Lena Kapila's work from Helsinki, Finland. I had the pleasure of sitting right behind her at a PCRM conference in Washington back in uh, 19, uh, sorry, 20, when was it? 2015, I believe uh, was when I went and wow, her presentation was amazing. I went because of the title that she had proposed back pain and disc degeneration as manifestations of cardiovascular disease. Now, if you do what I do and you know what I know, you've got to listen to this woman talk. So I had to fly to Washington and listen to this woman talk. I ended up sitting right behind her. It was a God thing. I loved it. And we had a great conversation after she presented her findings, but she's all about impaired circulation and pain and how it impacts the low back. So here's a little visual of the lumbar arteries. Um, and you've got your middle sacral artery as well, right? Now, there are three main branches to this. There's the posterior body wall, the vertebral body, and the nerve root, and the posterior peritoneum. Don't let these words scare you. I'm not going to quiz you guys later. But, but I want you to notice what happens when it impairs to each one of these branches. So if we get impaired blood supply to the paraspinal muscles, this is what you'll experience, pain related to exercise. Now, this isn't about you know, you really blasted yourself and you're sore the next day. This is about, I'm exercising and oh my gosh, the pain just won't stop. It's just, it's increasing. It's, it's not going away. Now, maybe you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, 
you, uh, you know, doing repeti repetitions against resistance if you've got a body part that's not working right for you is a whole different issue. So don't think that if you have this, you know, this means you've got impaired circulation to the posterior body wall. But if you're someone who you've sought all kinds of help, all kinds of people, you've seen a ton of people, nobody can figure out why it hurts to exercise. This, you know, depending on how long you've been eating a whole food plant-based diet, you know, this might be something that still needs to resolve in your body, right? And then it also shows failure to remove waste products. So you might get a lot more lactic acid buildup than the average person. And then the muscle can actually waste away and shrink if there's a lack of blood supply, or I shouldn't say lack, impaired. If there's a lack of blood supply, tissue dies, okay? We're talking about impairment here. And then what happens if it happens to the bones or the nerve roots around the spine? You'll get this dull, constant pain. Um, you get this inactivity. Stasis means there's no activity going on, right? Um, and some swelling happening around the bones. Bone sclerosis, end plate sclerosis, disc degeneration, all of this because of lack of blood supply to the bone. And then what about impaired blood supply to the nerve root? Sciatic pain, radicular pain. Now these can happen from other things too. You could have been sitting at a red light and got rear-ended and now you have a sacral torsion, which is making your piriformis unhappy and it's squeezing your sciatic nerve. There's a lot of other reasons you can have this, but if nobody can find a reason, this might be it. Imaging the lumbar arteries is challenging because they kind of hide behind the mesenteric. So, you know, the person needs to know what they're doing to get an image of these. And I don't know any doctor who's requesting imaging your lumbar arteries um, when you're complaining of low back pain, right? It's not something that a doctor tends to want to look at or has any knowledge of. So it probably mostly goes unknown, right? And then we've got your posterior peritoneum lack of or impaired blood supply. And that's where you're going to get pain along the sides of the low back and then related to these particular muscles, the psoas and the quadratum lumborum. And here's a picture of those. If you're curious about where they are and what they do, it's kind of like your hip hiker. And then your psoas is your hip flexor, which also has to lengthen and stabilize you when you're standing upright, especially when you're bending backward. So if you get back pain when you've been sitting for a while and you stand up, this muscle more than likely is not happy. Now, this muscle can be unhappy and have lots of blood supply. So just so you know, just because you have pain here, it doesn't mean you've got impaired blood supply. I'm just sharing this information in case you happen to be one of those people who nobody can figure it out. You stretch your psoas, you've done fascial work, you've done everything under the sun, you know, acupuncture, chiropractic, whatever, and nothing's resolving it. Well, maybe it's time to think about blood supply or changing to a whole food plant-based diet, low fat, high fiber, right? So moving on to inflammation. The Stanford University School of Medicine did a study to determine what was the primary cause of joint damage, osteoarthritis, right? Or rheumatoid arthritis, but osteoarthritis is, is more common. And what they determined was it had nothing to do with compression or wear and tear or old age. So yay, that's good news, right? It's chronic inflammation. So if we can figure out what's causing the chronic inflammation, we can pretty much prevent experiencing joint damage. That's pretty cool. I think anyway, I love to have power put back in my hands. So here's half the population uh, in this world, this country and most of the Western countries, um, you know, not the, the other countries, they don't experience what we experience until we start to put our fast food chains in their countries. Um, but half the population develops degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. And it is the leading cause of chronic disability in this country alone and a lot of Western countries. So let's look at a little bit of what food has to do with chronic inflammation, because that's what we're talking about here, right? There is something called arachidonic acid, and it does contribute to inflammation because it stimulates the production of those pro-inflammatory chemicals in the body, which means it promotes inflammation in the body. So it would seem to me we would kind of want to minimize arachidonic acid intake if that's the case. When you get too much of it, the body over responds with that inflammatory process. Now your body's constantly healing and repairing all the time on a cellular level, but it, it shunts itself. It turns it off, you know, in, in, in intermittently. But if you've got a lot of arachidonic acid in the body, guess what? It doesn't really shunt. It doesn't reverse. It doesn't turn off. It just kind of gets stuck on like a brick on the gas pedal. And so here are the sources in our food 
animal meats, oily fish. I put this like salmon because the whole world thinks salmon is a health food because of all those omega-3s, but it has just as much cholesterol and it has a lot of fat. Salmon's a very high fat food. You'd be shocked at how high fat it is. If you're trying to lose weight, it is not your friend. And uh, these things will produce the highest amounts of arachidonic acid in the body. Plants, fruits, veggies, grains, legumes, beans, lentils produce little or no arachidonic acid. And then of course, processed baked goods produce a moderate amount. No matter what side of the food fence you sit on, if you're keto, if you're vegan, guess what? You'll both agree that donuts are not a health food. So let's start where we agree and have a conversation, right? So here's some studies. This study looked at how diet affects inflammatory markers in the body. This is what we're talking about. If the Stanford um, School says that chronic inflammation is the reason for joint damage, well, what creates the inflammation? So here we looked at some blood markers and we divided uh, into quintiles, which was five groups based on daily intake of cruciferous veggies, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, those kind of vegetables. The average intake was about a cup a day, but those in the lowest quintile ate about half. Those in the top quintile ate one and a half. Okay, just, just cruciferous veggies. That's all they looked at was that intake. They then compared levels of two very common inflammatory markers of the body tumor necrosis factor or TNF and interleukin-6. And they found that the markers were 13 and 25% lower. So 13% lower in TNF, 25% lower in interleukin-6 in those women who ate the most cruciferous vegetables compared to those who ate the least. So eat your cruciferous vegetables, right? And then here's a study of this went to younger women that for other one was for middle-aged population. This is more younger, ages eight to 15, and they were overweight or obese. So we're looking at those who are struggling with excess weight and they put them into two groups. One added whole grains, the other did not. The whole grain group was asked that half the grain intake be from whole grains for six weeks. Then they avoided grains for four weeks and crossed over to the other group. So this was a really well done study. We saw what happened. It wasn't just, oh, well, you know, Mary did well with that, but, but Julie did not. No, they, they, they switched groups. And they saw the same result in the grain group. Now they consumed an average of 98 grams of whole grain a day, the control 11. That's the average intake of fiber in this country, 11 grams a day, which is very, very sad and very, very low. So the whole grain group had decreases again in those inflammatory markers, CRP, and then this nice long name, soluble intercellular adhesion molecule one they had decreases of 22%. The control group had increases. So I'm thinking the whole grain group did a lot better with inflammation, right? Which if that's what leads to joint damage, isn't that gonna help to protect your joints? Now, here's the last one on this for food and inflammation. This one showed two different studies where those who ate more fiber had a lower chance of symptomatic osteoarthritis. And then here, the upper quartile had a lower chance of the same thing compared to those in the bottom. So, and this was for the knees. So obviously this study was looking at knees, but it would seem to me, no matter what body part you're looking at, you're gonna see a very similar result. And then the last topic on food here is how does excess weight promote chronic inflammation? Well, fat cells produce inflammatory cytokines. They're like little factories and they love to promote inflammation in the body. It's one of their best jobs that they know how to do. And inflammatory cytokines have a few jobs. Uh, what they are is they're proteins. They serve as messengers between the cells. They bind to those target immune cells, triggering an immune response. So they're basically one cell is telling them, go tell that cell over there to switch on the immune response. And that's what they do. And of course, an excess of these cytokines that promote inflammation can lead to tissue damage, tissue destruction, like in rheumatoid arthritis, right? So the association between joint pain and obesity has been studied and well-documented. And I did a very deep study for many, many months. I, I don't even remember how many months I spent, six months, eight months, something like that creating a, um, a, a pain and obesity course. 
and I was just buried in this work, but I'm just going to show you a couple of things here. But a lot of studies indicate that obesity is related to not just the presence of osteoarthritis, but also how much it progresses and the severity that occurs. So here's one, you know, those who have a body mass index of 40 or higher have a 33 times higher risk of a total hip replacement and a nine times higher risk of a total knee replacement than those who are not obese. Right? And then I, I, I want to caution here, young non-obese individuals are seen to benefit from walking. They actually see improved femoral cartilage thickness, right? The femur is the thigh bone. So, and the cartilage is where the, the joints meet. It lines the end of the bone where, where you've got another, another bone and, and more cartilage and that's your joint. And so a lot of the times what happens with osteoarthritis is the cartilage, you know, becomes very thin, it disappears, it's injured, it's inflamed, whatever. So walking does see to improve this, but that's not seen in obese people, at least in this study. So what I caution is it's really important that you choose the right exercises when you are carrying excess weight. Um, you don't want to be beating up those joints. You want to be making sure that you're doing non-impact stuff initially right? If, as you're burning body fat and, and achieving a healthier weight. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't be doing weight bearing things, but you want to be careful the choices you make as you're achieving your goals. And then the Framingham study, the risk of developing NEOA was reduced by half when a small weight loss occurred, just five kilograms, right? And I think 2.25 uh, pounds is a kilogram. So that's about 11 pounds in the 10 years prior to assessment. And then patients who lost at least 10% of their body weight had improved levels of pain and better function. So say you're 200 pounds, you lose 20 pounds and better improved levels of pain and better function. Uh, those who engage in both doing exercise and a better diet had better outcomes than those who only did one strategy. They lost more weight, had less inflammation, more mobility, faster, better walking, and obviously health-related quality of life was more improved right? And it's dose dependent. The more weight the patients lost, the better they got. The weight loss was definitely dose dependent. So, you know, go for it, right? But you want to do it in a very healthy way. You don't have to starve yourself. And then just a couple more slides here, um, you know, conventional treatment. And, and I've got for back pain here, but it's for pain in any area of the body, actually, right? You get your conventional, you take your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you get your corticosteroid injections, maybe arthroscopic surgery, full-blown surgery. And then I say conventional PT here because a lot of modalities are used, a lot of hot packs and cold packs and ultrasound and e-stim and, and the exercises tend to be, um, I don't want to sound insulting to my own profession, but a lot of the exercises tend to be kind of cookie cutter. Oh, you're here for your knee? Well, you're going to do these exercises, right? Um, each person is unique like a fingerprint and each person needs completely different um, approach to resolve their issue. So it's, it's you never want cookie cutter exercises for anything. And then, you know, you might do a little massage, you might do a little manipulation depending on their training, but is it addressing the cause, right? And then even the World Health Organization says at present low back pain is treated mainly with analgesics and the causes of the lower back pain are rarely addressed. So that's 70% of the pie chart, what's happening to those poor people, right? So here's a real important question to ask when you experience pain, will this relieve the symptoms or resolve the cause? And that's my passion is to address the cause. And when I work with somebody, if they've got knee pain and I'm gonna go down into my gym and show you some movements and explain some authentic human function in a moment, but what you really want to understand is you don't want to just take a pill or have an injection or, or, or a procedure to address the specific symptoms. You, you want to resolve the reason the pain is there. And that'll make a lot more sense to you in, in the upcoming time I'm going to spend here. So let's finish this up. What's your goal? Do you simply want relief of pain or do you want resolution of the cause? Because that's going to give you a much more permanent solution right? And I am now going to, you know, explain the difference between conventional exercise versus authentic human movement, but I'm going to go down in my gym to do that. And I'm going to introduce you to three-plane training and how your body is actually designed to move. It's just an introduction. You know, we, we've got a short amount of time here, 
Um, if you do want to learn more, I do have a monthly newsletter that goes out. I've been doing it for, I think I just sent out my 102nd edition of my newsletter. And um, I always have a topic having to do with pain, musculoskeletal, nutrition, whatever, and then a recipe of the month and a, um, a tip of the month. So you may enjoy that newsletter. You can sign up at this website here. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I do have an event coming uh, the last week of this month where I'm going to teach how to have a strong back um, and age you know, free of pain. And uh, no matter your age, everybody wants a nice, strong, pain-free, healthy back. And it's free. So you can go to this website here and register for that. Okay. So now I'm going to transition to the gym. Carly's going to go ahead and change the spotlight here. And I will see you all down there in just a moment. Okay. So what we're going to do here is um, there, there's a difference between conventional exercise and authentic human movement. And how I wanted to explain this in a way where it would make sense to you, and I forgot to bring my, my watch down or my clock, so you'll have to let me know when we're getting close to the time here, Carly. But because I know we want to get to some of the questions too, right? Mm -hmm. So so the difference, you know, conventional exercise, I guess uh, this would be an easy way to explain it here. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of demonstrations. And I do have a YouTube channel where I have a lot of this stuff on there too. So conventional exercise, you go to the gym and you want to work your quads, right? So you get in the machine and you put your feet behind the little resistance bar there and you're pushing up against resistance. And I used to do this, right? I would have my toes turned out to work more inner quads, get that VMO. I'd have my toes turned in, right? Get the, the lateral quads and, and just really blast those quads. Well, unfortunately, that creates a, a lot of um, uh, tibia, femoral shear force on the knee the knee's not really happy because that's not authentic. When your thighs are in action, when your quads are actually asked to work, what they're doing is they're working. So as you go downstairs, your quads are lengthening to control your body going down the step. And I know I've got a step here. So let me explain that. So if I go, if I'm, if I'm going downstairs, this is a pretty high step, but if I go to step down, right, look what's happening here. This is getting longer under tension and it's controlling my knee bending as I descend the stair. That is nothing like this. This is making my quad get shorter at the knee, not longer. Yet going downstairs requires it to get longer and control the motion. The same thing with going to sit down. When I go to sit down here, guess what's controlling it? Max, my glutes, hamstrings at the hip specifically, and a little bit of quad, right? So same thing with doing squats, but you know, getting in and out of a car, all those things, that's authentic. That's what we really do in real life. You know, when I'm, when I'm even in sports, we don't do anything weird like that in sports. Even if you're, you're going, people would say, well, what about kicking a ball? Well, when I go to kick a ball, guess what muscle's working? The front of my hip is loading to come back with the, uh, with the amount of force to create tensional energy or tension in that muscle so that when I release the muscle, right, it's getting longer under tension, and then I let go, that's what's kicking the ball. It's not my quad shortening at the knee. That's not what's kicking the ball. So... We want authentic movement and we want that when we're training because when we're not doing that, when we're training, we are injuring ourselves. We are promoting inflammation, right? Itis, all the itises, bursitis, tendonitis, tendinopathy, all those things that we end up getting. And then we want to isolate body parts, which is probably one of the worst things we can do because your body's not designed to move in isolation. There's a physics thing, you know, I wrote a book, Pain Culprits, and I've got a whole chapter in there where I talk about the physics of movement. I don't go into great detail. It's aimed at, you know, the layperson. But the point is you want, you for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when we try to isolate a muscle to do an exercise, we're not isolating it. We can't because there's an equal and opposite reaction happening somewhere in the body. When I go to get up out of a chair, it's not, I'm not just floating myself up in the air. I'm pushing through the floor 
with this with the same amount of force that's required to lift my body weight. So it's pushing that's getting me up out of the chair. That's an equal and opposite force or reaction, right? And then to really explain eccentric loading of a muscle, which is that muscle getting longer to control movement, I like to use my little flying monkey here. So when I go to load a muscle because I want to do something, maybe do a squat. I want to, and then I got to be able to get back up out of that squat. So when I go down into the squat, I'm loading the muscle and then the muscle unloads or explodes to get me back up out of the squat. So here is just a little visual of the muscle loading. So as the muscle loads, it gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And the longer it gets, the more energy it's building, this tensional energy, right? And wow, have I got a lot of energy ready to explode or unload out of that flying monkey, right? So when you go to train your body, ideally you want to be loading your muscles and unloading them. Your muscles are designed to subconsciously react to movement and control the movement once it's initiated. Even the simple act of walking. Once I start walking, everything's controlling my gait. So get my step out of the way here and show you. So when I go to take a step, right? As soon as I start to swing this leg forward, guess what's controlling my leg swing? My hamstring, because my hamstring is attached to the butt bone. It comes down and crosses the knee on both sides. It's kind of like the reins on a horse. It's literally controlling my knee function it's controlling the rotation that's happening. When you walk, you move in all three planes, forward and back, side to side, and you turn. You're not just moving in one plane of motion looking like fiction and so you think you can dance, right? He's, he's my favorite. But none of us look like a robot when we move. So what happens when I do this, my hamstring controls that leg swing. It's getting longer under tension. And because it crosses the knee joint and connects to both sides, it's also controlling the rotation that's initiated, there is rotation that happens when you walk and a side motion that happens as well, right? And so it's controlling that and it's literally helping to extend my knee in gait. Now, how many of you in the gym use that machine, you put your, your foot, you got that little thing and you're pushing up against resistance, pushing up against resistance and you're gonna, Slam those hamstrings and get them as strong as you can, right? There is no authentic function for that whatsoever. I've never had anybody be able to tell me any task we do in any sport, gardening, golf, any, nothing where you do, you push against resistance using your hamstring. Doesn't happen. The hamstring's job is to get longer and control motion and control body parts during that motion. That's its job. That's authentic human movement. So hopefully that's kind of insightful. And I know many of you are going to be like, oh my gosh, I've been doing that in the gym forever. Well, stop <laughs> and start training properly, right? So let's move into some introduction to three plane movement and training. So we move in three planes. So let me explain that first, right? We move forward and back. So that's where we get this nice forward and back motion, that sagittal plane. You don't have to memorize the names, just know we move forward and back. Uh, and, and so that would be part like squatting, right? That would be in sagittal plane, leg going forward and back, arm going forward and back. That's all sagittal plane. Frontal plane, side to side. So that would be side bending. That would be when the leg goes sideways, either out or across. That's all going to be in that frontal plane motion, all that side stuff. Arms, this is frontal plane right? All of this, okay? Even this. Now we've got transverse plane. We've got rotation. We rotate right, we rotate left. Now your whole body can rotate, your neck can rotate, your pelvis can, you know, you can rotate different areas of the body. Your arms can rotate. I can rotate with my elbows straight. I can rotate with my elbows bent, right? My shoulder obviously can rotate. I can do, you know, 
circumduction, right? That shoulder being the most mobile joint in the body that I said a little bit ago. The hip is the second most mobile joint, and that has lots of rotation too, it, but it's all three planes. It has flexion and extension for sagittal, right? It has frontal, abduction, adduction, and it has rotation, external and internal. Now, I want you to pay attention here when it comes to rotation specifically. I can do non-weight-bearing rotation, which is relatively useless, or I can train in weight-bearing rotation which is extremely functional. So I can turn my leg in, I can turn my leg out, or I can stand on that leg and I can move my body so that I'm getting that weight bearing internal external rotation. And now those muscles are getting longer under tension, controlling my movement, subconscious reaction to the movement that's been initiated. And it's literally authentic human movement. So when you're going to work a body part, even if it's at the gym, you're better off to use free weights or some type of pulleys. Machines are not necessarily your friend because they're not going to fit your body perfectly. Most people, they've done studies. And a lot of people, when they go to the gym, they've, they've, they've improved machines now where they've got a lot more adjustments that can be made. But they say, uh, according to the data, your average person will not make more than two adjustments when they get on a machine at the gym. I'm thinking because they don't know, or they don't want everybody to stare at them, or they're in a hurry. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But if that machine's not lined up perfectly to you, guess what? P -p Potential injury, right? Itis. Also, a machine does not do the same thing when it comes to strengthening. The machine provides this external stabilizing source, right? So you don't have to stabilize yourself. You just have to push against the resistance. Stability is taken care of. So now you think you're stronger than you are, and you go and you have to lift something heavy out of your car, and you're like, well, when I'm on the machine, I can do this. I know I can lift this 50 pounds, but guess what? The machine's stabilizing you. When you're lifting it out of your car, you have to stabilize you and you're risking injury because you're not as strong as you think you are. You want to build that stability internally, not have it provided for you externally. So that's one of the biggest reasons I'm pretty much against machines, okay? So all of that said, free weights are better. Using TheraBand, TheraTubing, pulleys, those kind of things are better. Uh, body weight, body weight's huge. You could use your body weight. Oh my gosh, you do some one-arm push-ups, <laughs> you've got some strength going on, right? You you do deep squats and you know, you're know you holding some weight, you've got some strength going on, lunges. There's all kinds of things. So I decided since this is just an introduction, I wanna give you a little introduction into how to incorporate three planes of motion in a, like two or three different body parts. And then we'll, we'll, we'll answer the questions. So one body part that a lot of people are interested in is squats. That's, that's a very functional movement. How on earth would we do that with three planes of motion? You can alter your foot position. Now I'm not talking about, you know, you're trying to be the strong man of 2023 and you're gonna be pressing, you know, 500 pounds or whatever. I'm talking, just try using this with just body weight. You know what's going on with you. So if your knees are bone on bone or you got some other issue and you know you shouldn't do this, then don't do this. But, but the goal is everybody thinks when they do a squat that their feet should be hip width apart, toes pointed forward, everything perfect, and then do your squat. Now, the best way to do a squat is to have something behind you so that you can know that you're, you know, you don't want to drop like this. It's not like that's terrible, but when you drop like this, you're really kind of working more quad here. If you go back, you're really working more max and hamstring. And most people, because we sit most of our lives now, max kind of atrophies. He's, you know, you don't even need impaired blood supply for that atrophy to happen. It's you're sitting on him. And when you sit on a muscle, he weakens, shrinks, gets smaller, weaker. And so let's get max going, right? So Let's keep the knees back and have the bottom go back and down. And if you feel the weight on your heels and you feel your toes kind of come up a little bit, then you know you're doing it right. If you feel like you can't go very far and you kind of lose your balance, then do it at the kitchen sink so you feel safe and push through those heels to come back up. Don't pull yourself back up, right? So this is a great way to do squats 
right? And you can you can get all the way down there and not lose your balance, then you know you're good. Things are pretty efficient. You don't have to have your feet perfect side by side. And you can do 27 different foot positions. You can have them go wide. You can have them go narrow. You can have your feet turn out. And if they're turned out, you can have them go hip width, wide, or narrow. You can have your feet turned in. And if you've got them turned in, you can have them hip width, wide, or narrow. You could have one foot forward just slightly, just slightly, an inch or two, which is going to put more weight on, more load on the leg that's back. And then in that position with one foot forward, you can do it hip width, wide, narrow. You can do it toes in, all those three positions, toes out, all those three. So you're getting my point, right? 27 different foot positions for squats. That's going to give you three plane training for squats. And when you go to do something like squat down to get something out from under the kitchen sink, guess what? You know, when I go to do this, I'm not worried about, oh my gosh, are my feet hip width apart? Are my toes pointed forward? No, you're in the middle of doing something in the kitchen and you go under there, you open the doors and you squat down and who knows what position your feet are in. So your body needs to be prepared for life. It's a much better way. It's authentic, right? So there's squats. We can also do lunges in three planes. And a lunge in three planes, you can step forward, you can lunge sideways, you can turn when you lunge, right? And if you're hanging on to some weights, that can really do some work. You can also rotate upper body on lower body. So say I just go forward and I'm going to rotate my upper body, right? Or I'm going to side bend my upper body, or I'm going to reach forward or I'm going to reach backward and really load my abs and my psoas. There's so many ways that you can do three plane training with the body in pretty much every movement you do. It's, it's, it's infinite. There's no, there's no end. I, I run an online academy. We do a live class every Tuesday. We've never repeated the same workout and we're on or the same, well, some of the movements we've repeated, but very few. Oh my gosh, we're up to like 107 classes or something like that. So it's infinite. You never get bored. The body thrives on variety as long as you're training properly. The last one I want to show for three plane is shoulders because everybody wants to beat up those rotator cuff and it drives me crazy. So let me show you um, here. I'll just use, just use some eight pound weights. So three plane training, and I'm going to do this I don't want you to try this if you've got issues, but but if you're if you're good, you may like this. So this would be three planes, and I'm not isolating anything. I'm not going to isolate my lateral deltoid. Okay, I'm going to use my body the way it's designed. So I'm going to squat down so that I can push through the floor and capitalize on gravity and ground reaction force. And but I'm going to do it in three planes. So I'm going to come up, and I'm going to go right in front of my head. So now we're doing sagittal plane right? But that's loading the back of the body. What happens if I bend behind me and load the front of the body? You'll feel everything loading. What happens if I come up to the side, but I get my hip under the hands, so I'm not isolating. It's very functional, and you can build a lot of strength this way. And then what happens if I want to lean over and really load the side of the body in that frontal plane? And then what about rotation? I kind of wind up a little and I do an uppercut to a giant is how I call this one. So I'm now rotating in transverse plane and this is loading more the back of the body. And then if I wanna load the front of the body more, I'm gonna grab that giant that snuck up behind me and do a nice little uppercut there. So there's so many ways that you can train your body in three plane function, almost eliminate the risk of injury itises, all that stuff. I mean, there's always potential, you know, things can happen. You could drop a weight, you know, that kind of thing. But, but just know that if you're training your body authentically and you're doing it in three planes of motion and you're not trying to isolate things, you can even do a plank using three plane motion. You get down in the plank and you, know, you get down in the plank and you just have your pelvis go forward and back. There's, there's, there's sagittal plane in the plank. You can have your feet move. You can have one foot move out and in. When you're down in that plank position, there's frontal plane. You can have a foot roll over. There's transverse plane. It, you, know, you can do the same thing with your arms. Everything you do can be three-plane training. 
and you will feel fabulous. Okay, so that I don't keep going, I think it's probably a good idea to get to the Q&A. What do you think? Yes, you are just blowing my mind. Let me see, add spotlight. Okay, so, <laughs> wow, that's incredible. You know what that reminds me of? The way you're moving around and using resistance training at the same time, you're like dancing with weights. It's It, it yeah. looks much more fun <laughs> than, than one, two. And now, I love that you say that, Carly, position. because when we dance, all of our joints are involved and our proprioceptors are what provides that beautiful, efficient communication to the brain and our movement. The more joints we use, the more proprioceptors we use. That's why dancing makes you feel so good. It's just yeah. crazy that it goes against everything I've been taught when it comes to strength training. I feel like I've been uh, harming my joints for the past 30 years or, you know, 25, whatever. Well, the focus is now you'll be able to do it differently and you'll be able to see the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's, it's really wild how many things that I've been learning about recently that are completely opposite, you know, what the common held beliefs are. It's, it's really, it keeps you on your toes, I suppose. Well, you're a truth seeker. Thinking. So that's good. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, evidence-based all the way, which brings me to the initial part of your conversation, like uh, saturated fat and uh, oils and like, it doesn't matter what kind of fat, if it's in excess, it's going to be harming our uh, circulation and therefore likely leading to pain. Mm -hmm. I don't know many people that are not suffering from pain. So yeah, yeah. that said, let me get into these questions that okay. I have time for you too. So I'm hoping we can get to um, some that will generalize across the board. So the first one is that this woman just had a her just had hernia surgery and she's looking for natural ways to strengthen the abdominal muscles that don't <clears throat> include like sit up type movements. And she's also at um, age 57 and she's finding that her balance is declining and she'd love some tips for retaining good balance. Yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously I'm not diagnosing or treating anybody. Right. So I'm not going to be giving this woman specific advice. I'm going to speak generally on the topic that was presented because I could do harm. Right. I, I would it would be very unprofessional and irresponsible of me to tell this woman, you need to do 10 of this and 10 of that and you'll be fine. That would be terrible. But I'm just going to speak generally when somebody is um, I'm, I'm thinking this person has lost some anterior chain function because of the hernia right? And the, abil and the inability to, to use the abs in a way they would like to use them, that will contribute to instability because a lot of older people, you know, they're like this because they don't have the ability for these muscles to get longer and keep them from falling backward and smacking their head open. So, so that may be part of the instability issue, right? So it's important. And because these, you know, the psoas are kind of your stabilizers. I mean, we have a lot of things that stabilize us, but they have a, they have a big um, role in that. So a lot of the times what people want to do is they want to do crunches. They want to do sit-ups. They want to do all that kind of thing. They want to do leg lifts, right? All laying on the ground against gravity. If you really want the anterior chain to, for, to function when you're upright and on your feet, you need to train it upright and on your feet, right? Specificity of training. I don't care if you're strong enough to lift a car when you're laying on your back. What can you do when you're standing on your feet? That's what matters, right? So what I teach people to, to load that anterior chain, and of course, this person who, wherever they are in the post-surgical phase, they want to be very careful and make sure they check with their doctor. It's safe to do whoever they're seeing, right? Because a lot of times there's precautions post-surgery. But typically what I'll tell people to do is to use, you can have a, a TheraBand. Um, I've got one here. You can have a TheraBand, depending on what height you've got it attached to, um, it can make it harder or easier. But then if you have it overhead, and I don't know if I've got my camera high enough for you to see this, but if you have your elbows right by your ears and keep them there, then you can, you can, kind of lean back a little and really load that anterior chain. And I don't know if you can see me trembling here a little because I got a bit of resistance here and then come back just past neutral. So as you can see, I'm not shortening my abdominals. I'm lengthening them under tension and really making them work, right? This is one of the best workouts you can do to improve stability if anterior chain weakness is part of that. 
And you can also do that with one foot forward and really, so now I'm gonna load more this hip because it's extended and then you can do the other way. So those are great ways to, you know, and, and laying on your back, to, again, post-surgical, you know, you could pop some stitches. I mean, you can really create a lot of abnormal pressure versus that way. That way is more authentic. So it tends to be more effective. Okay, so you don't recommend yoga for improving um, balance and coordination? I am not. Yoga, there's a lot of data that shows yoga is can be extremely beneficial. As a matter of fact, a woman that I admire very much, who's the founder of Wellness Form Institute for Health Studies, where I got my diploma in nutrition education, used yoga and chiropractic and, and exercise to recover from a serious accident and got her life back because of that. So I, I have nothing against yoga. It's it's not my personal go-to. I, I just it doesn't float my boat. For, I just I just don't care for it. Now I know when I was on Chef AJ, she's like, "Well, what type of yoga did you try? There's different types, and maybe you didn't." And we got talking about that a little bit. But I like I like movement, like you said, the dancing, right? I, I like movement. I like to 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 do things that way, and not everybody. You know, I I think it was Jack Medina who who was the uh, summer training coach for Kathy Rigby, and he said that the best exercise in the world is the one you'll do. So what if you don't care for something? Well, you need to have an, another option, right? So I think yoga is great. I've had a lot of people come to me who've been injured from yoga for one or two reasons. Either the instructor was not very well trained or skilled and didn't provide enough modifications in the class, or the student, my patient didn't want anybody to look at them not doing what everybody else was doing and did something they knew they shouldn't do anyway, right? So injury can happen. You have to be very careful and you have to make sure your instructor knows what they're doing. So yoga can be great, but you've got to, when it comes to stability, you know, you can, you can try to balance on one leg till the cows come home. But if you're not training the body to lengthen under control and control that motion, then stability is going to have a hard time improving. That's exactly what yoga flow is. It's like a dancing yoga. You should try okay, it. I'm going to have to try I'm, that I'm one. Chef AJ. You got to try this yoga flow. I know. Well, I told her to let me know. I said, AJ, come on, tell me, tell me the ones you like and I'll, I'll give them a try. Okay, great. Okay. So this woman is experiencing pain in her hip and back area. She had PT about a year ago and was fine, but now it seems to be coming back. She was told it was sciatic nerve and to do a red light therapy. I'm not sure what WA and then AC means. Down, um, any suggestions? I am doing Pilates and walking daily. So again, I can't diagnose anybody, right? So, and, and I can only think, you know, the PT may have been very conventional, may have been very much, okay, we're going to focus on the hip. We're going to focus on that back. We're going to treat those areas and we're going to see if we can get your symptoms down. Um, so when you're training the body in three planes and you're doing it authentically, a lot of the reasons for pain get resolved, they get addressed, right? So that's important. Now, I don't know what's going on with this person, you know, if they've got anything structurally happening in the hip, maybe, you know, you could have a labrum tear, there could be anything going on. Sciatic tends to be pain that goes down the leg or stays in the butt, but it's that they just kind of want to push their fist up into their butt and get rid of that pain, right? So, and that tends to be the sciatic nerve is the, is the only nerve that comes down into the leg and then it branches off into perineal and all the other ones. So um, the sciatic nerve can be annoyed either coming from the trunk, from the, the vertebrae itself, or from the piriformis, which is a really deep butt muscle that goes from anterior sacrum diagonal across the butt and attaches to the outside of the hip bone at the greater trochanter, that, that bumpy bone right there. So, and about 87% of the population, the sciatic nerve comes out under the piriformis or through the piriformis. So if that piriformis muscle is spasming, it can create pain and, and make that nerve not happy. Now, there are different reasons that piriformis may not be happy. Um, you could get something called a torsion. You know, you're sitting at a red light and somebody rear ends you and you get this torsion that, that happens and the sacrum torques. And now the piriformis is kind of getting yanked out of position. And when you pull abnormally on a muscle, it pulls back. It creates this low-level tug of war. It's not happy. So 
you got to see why is that sciatic nerve not happy? Is it happening at the spine? Is it happening because the piriformis isn't happy? If that's true, you want to get somebody who knows good manual energy, um, manual movement techniques. Um, muscle energy technique is my favorite for that. It'll, it'll fix pretty much anything that's going on in the body. And then a nice strain and counter strain technique to calm down the piriformis if that's still squeezing on the nerve. So there's different reasons for that. Um, you know, movement can improve something like that. Will it resolve it? It really depends on the person. Uh, there's, there's a lot of variables because people are unique, like a fingerprint. Every single person is so unique, you know, like, you know how they say no snow, no two snowflakes are alike. Well, it's the same with people. Absolutely. Because you've got your own history of trauma or injury, you know, interpersonal environment, nutrition, um, accidents, injuries, strength, hobbies, sports. I mean, we're all so unique. Our mindset, our emotions, our personalities completely makes us all so different. So that's why there's no, there's no cookie cutter protocol to fix things that is effective because what works for one person may harm another. So it's important, you know, to know that. But um, for this person, there's so many, it depends that I can't really give specific advice as far as movements. It would be unsafe, but I wanted to give some information in case they didn't, they can maybe seek somebody in the area that has training in, in those things. There's also the McKenzie protocol, um, or I should say McKenzie program, which is a classification system. And if this person does have what's called um, a derangement, which sounds terrible, but it's real easy to fix in McKenzie. If this person has a derangement causing the sciatic pain, McKenzie can be almost miraculous in resolving it. So if they haven't seen a McKenzie trained therapist, that might be a good idea too. Okay. So do you suggest that she lays off the Pilates and the walking until she talks to a professional or are those? Well, walking is always a good idea, if, especially if it's not aggravating things. If the Pilates isn't aggravating anything, um, the one thing about Pilates from what I've seen, and I'm not an expert in Pilates. So if I'm misspeaking, please forgive me. But I think a lot of the work that's done in Pilates is, is laying down. And again, if all the work you're doing is laying down or most of it, it doesn't translate into what happens upright because once you're laying down, you've completely eliminated ground reaction force and mm -hmm. well, not completely eliminated, but mostly eliminated ground reaction force and gravity. It's very different when you're laying down than when you're upright. So um, training and upright is key. Sure. And I know you touched on this briefly uh, during your presentation, but I work with a lot of people who are significantly overweight to the point where it's really painful to try to move and put weight on their joints. So mm -hmm. you just recommend walking across the board for people who are trying to fix their diet. Yeah, walking is great. There's a great three plane kind of a three plane warm up for people and just standing in place and doing a nice three plane hip matrix, just moving forward and back. This loads the front of the body, the back of the body, you know, some side to side, like you're tapping parallel bars, some rotation, and this is just a great way to just start getting those muscles feeding each other properly and getting that three plane motion back in the body uh, by driving with the with the pelvis. That's a great warm up. But there there are things you can do, right? Um, you know, a lot of stride work, supported, holding on to things, being in a stride position and doing those motions, right? Adding arms in when they feel better, that kind of thing. There's there's a lot that can be done. Um, I've worked and also I've worked with people who were morbidly obese and when they changed their diet and they hydrated well, they saw a difference in just getting them moving. I mean, I've worked with people 400 plus pounds and just just getting them moving, doing the matrices. Wow. They, they feel better. Yeah. They're able to get off a, a, a chair better, all kinds of things. Yeah. I'm glad you added hydration. And I always preach that as well. So this person is experiencing numbness and tingling when particularly driving and working at the computer. Is this a result of musculoskeletal complications? Well, numbness and tingling obviously is not normal. We're not meant to experience that um, during normal tasks. And usually what it means is something's compressing and then releasing on the nerve because pure numbness means there's compression on a nerve and it's staying there. So you feel numbness and, and the numbness isn't going away. When you get that tingling and everybody, especially if you're a woman, you you know, most guys don't cross their legs, but some do. But, you know, if you cross your legs, how many of you have had your foot go to sleep, right? It gets numb. And so you do this and now you're doing this and you get those pins and needles just like to beat the band, right? That's compression off the perineal nerve. 
So, you know, when the compression was there, you got the numbness, you take the compression off and you're getting that pins and needles. So if somebody's experiencing that, then it means there, there's some intermittent compression, um, decompression going on. So typically, um, a lot of the times, and they didn't say whether it was upper or lower extremity, I'm assuming upper from the way they, they spoke, um, that, you know, the nerve supply to your arms is coming from the neck, uh, right down to, you know, C7. And so there's a couple of ways that can be a, a problem. The neck, you've got your cervical plexus here, and a plexus is just this really complex network of nerves, kind of like, you know, a super highway that's got all these roads that cross over each other in the middle of cities. And, and so if, if it's here, then you can get some spasm going on in the scalenes, the, the neck muscles aren't happy. And so they'll kind of squeeze and release, squeeze and release. So you'll get that numbness, pins and needles kind of a thing. It can also happen in the brachial plexus, which is the axilla, the armpit, which is why you're not supposed to rest on your armpits when you're using crutches, because you can create permanent nerve damage. Um, and so that can have some issue going on. And a lot of the times, if that's the problem, it's usually a rib area, like the third rib might be what's called depressed, which means it's kind of pushing on a nerve a little bit. And if the person's sitting, you know, if they're moving around a little bit, that might be why they're getting the compression and the decompression, because they're not staying perfectly still like you're playing, you know, um, poker, right? So so that said, you, you, you want to figure out okay, what's happening? Why is it happening? What position am I in that's making this me feel this more often than not? And then you, a lot of the times, the best thing to do, and this is a relatively safe advice to give anybody, unless they've got severe osteoporosis, is to mobilize the thoracic spine. And that's between the neck and the low back. You've got 12 vertebrae. And the thoracic spine is kind of like the silent saboteur. You don't realize that it stopped functioning well, but you get pain in the neck or the shoulders or the low back or the hips. And so nobody thinks the thoracic spine is the culprit, but it is. I mean, I've got a consult I'm working with right now who's had pain for over a decade in her neck and the base of her skull. And after the first session, I taught her how to mobilize her T-spine. She had her first day pain-free in over a decade. She was blown away. So nobody's addressed her thoracic spine. They've all been treating her neck, right? So, so that said, it's usually safe to mobilize the thoracic spine. And there's lots of great ways to do that. Um, I've got some YouTube videos on that, but, but to you just, you, you know, get forward and back. Really, your arms can help move the upper T-spine because T1, 2, and 3 kind of have to move when you do full motion with the shoulder. So getting lots of full motion here will mobilize the upper T-spine. So going forward and back. And then you've also got side to side. And you can do this in sitting. Um, it might actually mobilize it a little bit easier in sitting because now your hips don't become part of it and the T-spine has to really respond. And then, of course, you've got, you know, rotation where you're really trying to to mobilize that t-spine so um see if that doesn't kind of make a difference you know just getting that t-spine unlocked getting it moving can make a big difference so hopefully that helps yeah that's great insight thank you so much so i want to respect your time so we won't get into too many more um let's see this i know my answers are kind of long sorry <laughs> no that's fantastic you're thorough um, okay, so can you explain the drawbacks of using steroid treatments for pain relief in the short term and long term use? So steroids, a corticosteroid injection is meant to address inflammation. It's an anti-inflammatory, right? There are risks involved. People don't realize that. You can get um, osteonecrosis. You can get death of bone near the injection site. You can get thinning of bone, osteoporosis near the injection site. You can get um, uh, tendon ruptures. You can get ligament issues. You can. There's all kinds of side effects, risks of corticosteroid injections. There's also a lot of data out there that shows that you know there, I got one study and I was limited in how many slides I could present. I got one study that shows two years of injections to the knee ended up causing more damage to the joint than benefit. Um, the same thing with the hips. They're seeing more osteonecrosis of the femoral head, which is death of the bone of the femoral head. So 
they're seeing a lot more, you know, progressive things happening where these injections are happening. And um, so there's a lot of risks involved. And then as I tell people, well, you're medically manipulating the inflammation, but you're not addressing the reason the inflammation is there. So if the inflammation is there because of what you're putting in your mouth or because you're carrying excess weight, medically manipulating the, the inflammation so that you have less pain allows you to use the joint more now, but the joint is still not aligned properly. The muscles are still not controlling the movement optimally. So you're technically you're at risk of causing more harm and injury to the joint because you've medically manipulated the pain, but you haven't resolved the cause. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So let's do one more. And then we'll talk about how to get in touch with you. Cause I know a lot of people are going to want to follow up with you on these responses. How do we resolve nerve pain created by degenerative diseases like stenosis? Stenosis is a really challenging thing because it, it varies among people. Stenosis is when something narrows, right? So you've got your openings in the vertebrae where the nerve roots come out. And stenosis means those openings where those nerve roots come out have narrowed, right? They're, 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 you've got some calcification, bone spurs, whatever going on, uh, a lot of inflammation. And so now we've got some issues. Now, sometimes it's just segmental. It's just one or two or three segments that have some stenosis. Sometimes it's the whole thing. Sometimes the actual central canal where the spinal cord comes down through the vertebrae is, has some narrowing. So it, it's really specific to the person what's going on. Stenosis usually, depending again on the person, doesn't like extension because when you're extending, and if I'd have brought Betty Bones down here, I would have thought of that. When you're extending, what you're doing is you're getting those vertebrae to kind of compress where those openings are already smaller. So usually stenosis prefers flexion because it kind of opens those things up, right? So um, it... Uh, it, it really varies according to the person and um, and and where it's happening and and how extensive it is. Thank you so much, Eileen. You've been so generous with your time. So yeah, I know that thank you, you for have, having me. Yeah, I know that you have um, a free back pain masterclass coming up on the twenty seventh here, and um, I'll put all of your contact information in the description box below. But is there anything else, any other way you want to mention how people can get in contact with you or other things that you're offering right now? Uh, well, there's the the back masterclass coming up. Um, I also do have a what I call a move without pain private club. And there's a free level membership. People might like that because if they want to assess their three plane function and they're really excited to check that out, there's a 21 minute video on there that teaches how to do that. And there's even a PDF that they can download and document their findings. Um, and then there's a free movement class that introduces three plane training and shows a lot of exercises and how to modify them. And then an actual workout. And there's also a geek quarter talking about the uh, importance of hydration. Um, and then I, there's a Q&A in there where I talk about inversion tables and scoliosis. So it's a really well-rounded free level membership where there's a lot of information in there. And they can find that at um, MWP, which stands for Move Without Pain. So it's MWPPrivateClub.com. And they can check that out too. Great. And you have a very thorough, informative monthly newsletter, by the way. So if people want to say I do. Well. Yes. Thank you for that. It, that. it just went out too yesterday. I don't know if you had the chance to see it. But, I did. Uh, and I kept yes. scrolling and scrolling. I was like, wow, I'm jealous. You put way more value in your content, but you do it monthly. I try to do it more weekly. So hopefully it. Yeah. It yeah. Out. <laughs> yes. I'm sure yours is beautiful. I've got to see it. You got to let me know. Oh, yeah. absolutely. This was fun. I hope you come back. I'm sure we're going to have more questions and then you can answer the rest of the questions that I yes. have. Oh, I'd love to. I could talk about any, pretty much anything you want as far as musculoskeletal or nutrition or whatever. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much, Eileen. You're welcome. Bye now. Bye everybody.